it's funny. There's times that I'll be working with a new client and they'll, they'll want to buy something and I'll say, no, you don't want that. You want the less expensive option. And they're going, what kind of salesperson are you? Hey, hey, Brian Miller here and welcome back to One New Person, the show where we take a closer look at chance encounters to remind ourselves that every interaction is meaningful and every person we meet is important. Today's guest is Carolyn Schreier, the Director of Marketing for Mitzvah Market, a comprehensive resource for Jewish families planning their bar and bat mitzvah celebrations. Carolyn and I met just a few years ago at one of their vendor showcases, where families get to interact with DJs, caterers, entertainers, decorators. If you've ever been to a wedding or bridal expo, it's like that but for 13 year olds. In this episode, we discuss how Carolyn went from a degree in economics to a career in service of the Jewish community. Why we should refrain from judging how others choose to celebrate their special occasions. And of course, her story of a chance encounter with lasting impact. And by the way, her story literally moved me to tears over and over again during post-production. Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoy. All right, Carolyn, thanks so much for being here with me today. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. I have to start by asking you a question that I ask everybody who has an unusual job. When you meet someone at a party or a social gathering and they say or they ask, what do you do? How do you answer? It's funny. It depends on who's asking in certain uh, situations, mostly because if people don't know what bar and bat mitzvahs are, I kind of have to frame what I do a little bit differently. But my general answer is that I work for a website that helps people with party planning, mostly for bar and bat mitzvahs and and sweet 16s. And then I usually make a joke that says, I know every way to spend money at a party. Let me follow up on that. What is the craziest way you've ever seen somebody spend money at a party? Creative or um, ostentatious? they can vary. Either no, and or both. <laughs> yeah, I, I've seen the stories where someone rents out the Barkley Center to do their kids bar mitzvah and Pitbull is rappelling down the side before he gives a performance. And those are the ones that make page six and you know wind up in the news and on YouTube. Um, but then I see other creative things where families really want to make a play on what makes their kid special. And that could be camp. And they do a a camp theme and everyone's involved in a giant game of tug of war or they make it, you know, color war with specialized t-shirts and and people compete. And it, it, it's a, it's a different way of um, celebrating. I see a lot of people um, look, I, I get to be involved mostly with the party aspect of the celebration, but in reality, a bar and bat mitzvah is religious rite of passage. So people are always looking for different, personalized ways of incorporating family, incorporating tradition into the service so that it becomes an even more meaningful experience for a child. Because at 13, you get it, but you don't get it. It's one of the beauties of the age. So there's a lot of, you know, if you find an old prayer shawl that came from a grandparent or even a great grandparent that the child then gets to wear that's connecting the generations. I find that to be a very creative Thing. I've also seen, um, I had a couple families, they wanted to incorporate late parents or grandparents and they had the wedding dress from the mother or the grandmother and brought it to a seamstress who made a talus, a, a prayer shawl out of the wedding gown. So the, the younger child got to, to bring part of their, their heritage into the event. See that, that's so cool. And I've seen, you know, I've so many of them are, are becoming almost like a rave. I mean, they're they're becoming these these you know off the walls crazy events. And like, not that there's anything wrong with that if that's what you're looking for. Have you found the cultural or the religious aspect of it is getting lost a little bit in the party planning lately, or is it just depend on the family? Um, I really don't think it's getting lost. I think that. The part that is more public facing is the celebration and the secular aspect of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what you see more of, and it makes it look like things are getting out of hand, ostentatious, if you will. What I always say to people, um, because I turn into a mitzvah therapist at varying times, especially for a lot of my friends going through the process, is that you're sharing a part of your family 
and a life cycle event of your family with other people. And it's incredibly gracious that you would go and do that. And whether that's pizza in your backyard, whether that's sitting after a service and and singing other religious songs or prayers, or whether that is a, a blowout with Pitbull at the Barclay Center, it doesn't matter because you are sharing yourself with other people and you're letting them be a part of a great time in your life. So it, it really, it's all relative. And, and one is not crazier than the other. It, it's a different way of, of, of showcasing your excitement. That's such a great different perspective. And, and you know, what's funny is that even though I, per, I perform at these all the time now, or at least on a fairly regular basis, I've started to, to, to feel like that a little bit, you know, that, that some of these events, and I, he, I hear the rumor, I hear it, the rumblings from the grandparents, because I spend a lot of time at these events really with the older relatives uh, who are desperately covering their ears and trying to get away from the DJs. But I'm at the back of the room or out in the lobby with the grandparents doing card tricks to keep them entertained. And, you know, I've heard, I've heard a little bit from them. They're like, you know, this, this is too much, you know, this isn't, but I love that perspective that, that you just brought that I, I think by incorporating the party, the party aspect is the way to, especially maybe to bring people in that aren't of the faith, that don't really get what it is, but to bring them into the celebration, to bring them in. And, and you said it was gracious. It's, it's generous, right? It is. Yeah. Are you and able how to- how fortunate ge- are you that you can share something good in your life? Not everybody yeah. has that opportunity. Yeah. Now I love that. I love that that uh, that perspective. Are, are you able to break down fairly simply for the for the listeners who uh, maybe are not Jewish or don't know anything about um, that? Just we, we kind of danced around it, but just in a sentence or two, what is a bar bat mitzvah? What is that? Uh, a bar bat mitzvah is a religious ceremony that happens when a child, normally for a boy, turns thirteen; a girl turns twelve where they become an adult in the eyes of the Jewish community and the Jewish faith. And that has been around for, I mean, forever, pretty much. Uh, do, you, do you, have you ever wondered if the 12 and 13 fit ought to have been at some point updated to 16 or something just because? So I don't. And it's, it's interesting when my children were becoming bar bat mitzvah, we had to take a class with the rabbi at the synagogue and it was parents and children together for this 13 week session. And we talked a lot about why is it now? And we talked a lot about puberty and how there's all these different changes and all these different things that go through your mind, that go through your body, that you're you're changing in so many different ways. And it really is the spot where you go on to become, to have adult ways of thinking, to have an adult body, to have an adult mindset, whether you're ready for it or not, Mm -hmm. that is the time. And so in a lot of ways, it makes sense that this coming of age ritual is happening at the same time, all these other crazy changes. I think the rabbis kind of got it right. Yeah, that, 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 that's interesting because, you know, the, part of me thinks 13 isn't what it was thousands of years ago when the lifespan, the average lifespan was so much shorter, was like 25 years or whatever, right? I mean, that was like middle age at that, you know, at, at one point. <laughs> but, that far, but. But, right? <laughs> but, but on the other hand, uh, I also spend so much time, you know, speaking for and speaking with high schools, some middle schools, parents, educators. And in in some ways, I think the technology, the social media and the access to information has actually made kids grow up faster and faster lately. I think their access to information and their ability to gather stuff about the world you know, at their fingertips in a moment's notice, I think they're having more mature conversations about what's going on in their lives sooner and easier now, maybe, maybe than ever. Yes. But at the same time, one of the the pitfalls of the phone and of social media and of the fact that nothing goes away. And when we were kids, you could make a mistake and you could grow from the mistake and you can move on. At this point in time, kids have to be fully formed humans by the time they get a phone, because anything that they talk or say or do is going to be there for all eternity. And you see that happening more and more. You, you are not allowed to evolve. You, you, right. You, you are. If it's on, if it's on tape, if it's on your phone, that's who you are for the yeah, rest for of the, your life. For the and, rest and of that's your life. Fair. You know, I mean, I, I think it's like what happens when we go back and watch some of the '90s sitcoms now that don't hold up as well. Uh, Friends, Friends doesn't hold up at all. One of the greatest shows of all time. There are so many really, really cringy jokes that we would never make now. That's got to be a rough thing for 
kids. And you can see it at the events, at the at the mitzvahs. You can see, you know, they're recording each other and they're filming each other. And you're like, oh man, whatever you do tonight's there forever. You and know. they don't get that because they think it goes away if they delete it or after 24 hours on an app, yeah. or, but that's not the case. What do you love most about what, what you get to do? It's twofold. You know, on the, on the professional side, I love that I get to hear about all these interesting things that go on and meet interesting people because I work with vendors. I'm not working with families to, to plan their event. I am a resource to connect the families with the people who can make their events possible. I, I am that conduit um, in working with the vendors to put them onto the website. The other side of it though is I like having knowledge. I like when people ask me questions and I'm able to answer them and 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 be a resource for them. My my nickname among a lot of my friends was Google. You don't Google something, you Google it. You ask Carol, <laughs> chances are she has the answer for it. And I'm one of those people who is full of useless information. And I get excited when it's actually useful to someone. Did you did you go to school for event planning or do any formal training in it? So I I have a bachelor's degree in economics from Tufts University. I graduated with a degree knowing how to think. I, I can't say I did more than that. I always wanted to work in not-for-profit. And I worked professionally in the Jewish community for another number of years and then out of the Jewish community, but always in fundraising, special event fundraising. And that was really what I enjoyed doing. So most of my career before I took time off uh, to be a full-time mom was, or time off of my professional life to be a full-time professional mom, uh, was to plan galas and art auctions and walkathons and and all kinds of neat things like that to raise money for the particular organization. So I do have a background in what a lot of people do and working in this. Um, and I have a background in fundraising, which helps on the sales side because it's really not all that different. Uh, you know, the end result is just that you make money versus you're giving money to a good cause. <laughs> I, I guess my training in, in my previous professional life has helped me for my new professional life, but it wasn't anything that I could have gone to school for. Yeah. Almost everybody I know and talk to who is successful has a background in something that has n- almost nothing to do with what they're actually successful in. Isn't that weird? Yeah, and it's weird. It feels weird. And then I think about it. And most of those same people, like you said, have a degree in something. Yours was economics. Mine was philosophy. Like you said, you have a degree in learning how to think as opposed to there, you know, there are certain types of of kind of degrees you can do that teach you facts. You know, you have to memorize a lot of facts. Then there's degrees like economics, like math, like philosophy that really teach you how to think through problems, slightly different ways, but fundamentally how to go from A to B to C, how to work backwards from something, how to creatively find a solution to, to a problem. And I, I find so many successful people that have a background in something that they're really not using. It was something that teaches them how to think and not what to think. In all that, in your background and what you're doing now, what do you find is the most useful skill that you have in having kind of been really successful in, in this cultivating this business? Probably reading people. Mm-hmm. and getting to know people. And I definitely think that's from my fundraising background. It's funny, there's times that I'll be working with a new client and they'll, they'll want to buy something and I'll say, no, you don't want that. You want the less expensive option. And they're going, what kind of salesperson are you? you you're selling me less. And I'll say, but that's not the right thing that you need. And if I can tell you what you actually need and I can make that work for you, you might spend more money with me in the future because you know that I'm steering you in the right direction. I'm not looking to just go out and and take someone's money. I don't think anyone in my organization really is looking to do that. Um, But one of the things that I pride myself on is that I I will make the best recommendation for what the client needs so that I can ensure success, even if that's at a lower price point, because it's better for them. And if it's better for them, they're going to want to do more in the future. That just reminds me of something that Gary Vaynerchuk talks about all the time, which is we're now in a different economy where the most valuable asset is trust. Absolutely. And if, and I find what it's so, when you said that, I I do that, I end up doing that all the time. Somebody comes to me thinking what they want is like my top package. They want this and this and this, and then they describe their event and they've got like 25 people in, in, you know, in a private living room at their house. And I'm like, you don't want a 90 minute theater show. 
even though I would charge you five times for that. And I know you have the budget because, you know, I know who you are and who you're calling from. Exactly. And I'll go, you really just want me there for an hour to do close up card, card tricks in your living room and everybody will love it and it'll be intimate and it'll cost you way less. And you make a lot less money because I know they would have paid whatever I said, but you take the less money, you give them exactly what they actually need and you earn their trust and they will refer you and they will come back to you. And they, it's, it's such a better way of being, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and there are people who I've spoken to over the years and I'll say, let me be a resource to you. We're not going to work together right now. You're not ready for, for what I have. That's not the point you're at in your business, but you will be in a year from now. And you're going to appreciate that I'm here and I'll help you look for the things that are free right now to help get you started so that when you're ready and you have the budgeting, you're, I'm going to be your first phone call. On that note, the idea that being able to read people and cultivate trust is really the, the key to your success as you see it. You know that the main theme of this show, this podcast, is about chance encounters and lasting impact and the kind of ripple effects that our daily interactions have and that sometimes or almost we almost never know until we can look back on it, right? So do you have a story, some stories, a handful of stories of meeting people, even if it's not a specific person that really had an impact on you in some way? Well, there's definitely like one defining moment. Sure, please. Um, so when I was in, in college, I've always been active in the Jewish community as a Jew, as a, as a volunteer, as a, that, that has always been my passion, which is why Mitzvah Market's kind of interesting because it, it still keeps me involved in the Jewish community, though I don't call myself a professional Jew anymore. <laughs> but when I was in college, I, there, there's, a, there's an organization now called Birthright Israel, where a lot of young college age and, and just post-college age Jewish um, students are able to go to, on a 10-day Israel trip for free to be able to, to see the country and, and have a connection and, and meet other Jews in the process. Before that existed, uh, Jewish Federation, the umbrella organization around the country, used to run college student trips over winter break to Israel. And my sophomore year in college, I was going on one of these trips. I couldn't wait. I was ready to go. I had applied to people and got you know, extra money towards it. So I didn't have to pay so much because it wasn't free. <laughs> In those days. And at that point, I was um, running fundraising campaigns for the Jewish community on my college campus. And I applied for a special, I think they called it the leadership bus. And I applied for this, this bus and I got on the bus. And it was a group of 20, 25 of us from across the country, four days in Moscow to meet the Jewish community of Moscow before we went on to Israel. December 1995, or five years post the fall of the USSR. Um, I'll always remember it was 4,680 rubles to the dollar when five years ago it was, you know, 20. And, you know, it was, it was a whole different world. Um, people were freely allowed to be Jewish where they weren't under communism. Um, and we were there to see firsthand what it was like for young people living in, in Moscow. So it's the end of December. I've never been so cold in my entire life. Um, Everything I owned, I think I wore every single day and it wasn't even enough. Um, But one night it was Hanukkah and we take for granted Hanukkah in the United States. You light candles, you get presents, you sing some songs. And the the religious arm uh, in, in Moscow was doing a candle lighting ceremony in front of the Bolshoi Ballet building. And they took us to see this candle lighting and to, to be with the community. And we had no idea what to expect. We're, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old. And we get there and they have this giant erected menorah and they're lighting, I think it was the, the fifth or sixth night of Hanukkah and they're up in the, you know, the, the cherry picker lighting the, the, the oil and a klezmer band starts to play and we're standing and the Bolshoi Ballet Theater is lit up behind us and there's this gigantic Christmas tree next to us. And this klezmer band starts to play and people start to dance the hora. The hora is a celebratory dance that you might have seen at a Jewish wedding, where everyone forms a circle, joins hands or locks arms, and dances to Israeli folk songs. And we joined in with this community to dance the hora around the Christmas tree because that was where the space was to be able to dance. It, 
you know, you look at something that you can't believe that you're a part of it from the outside looking in and, and you're having this experience. And I remember our guide turned to us and said, five years ago, there would have been a pogrom if people tried to do this. We would have been under attack. This never would have happened. And she was as moved as this, this Russian woman was as moved as, as we were being a part of this because this in her lifetime wasn't something that was ever going to happen. And there we were freely expressing joy in being Jewish in the middle of former communist Russia. And that was, it, it, it had never gone away. That was in 1995. So it's almost, <laughs> it's, it, it's a long time ago already. And I will never forget it ever. And that probably started me formally on my path saying, oh, I can make a career out of working in the Jewish, out of being in the Jewish community. I don't have a follow-up question. I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm, need to I'm, you. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kind of there right now. It, I, I mean, I've told that story a, a number of times over the years because it just, it yeah. doesn't go away. It, yeah. it, it doesn't. And there's been, you know, other times in my life and other experiences that I've been fortunate enough to have, but it, I don't think anything will compare to that. So instead of trying to ask uh, a follow-up no, I'm sorry, question, it's not a just, person. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's beautiful. It's, uh, if you wanted to, you could go back and figure out who the person was that mentioned the trip and there's your person, right? Somebody mentioned that trip and that put you off on this, on this, this path. And that's kind of, that's kind of the whole um, idea. Instead of trying to ask a follow-up question just for the sake of doing it, because that's what you're <laughs> supposed to do when you're an interviewer, I'm going to just let that sit because it's so powerful on its own. I'm going to pivot back to something. And if you don't want to talk about this, it's fine. It's a little bit more of a personal family kind of question. Kids, you have two kids, right? I do. And um, they've twins. both... Twins. So is it B'nai Mitzvah? Uh, so for... If it's two boys or it's a boy and a girl, it's a B'nai mitzvah. If it's two girls, it's a B'not mitzvah. I did not know that. I knew yes. B'nai mitzvah because I performed at a few of them and had to learn that. Did you feel extra pressure planning your own kids, uh, B'nai, B'nai, B'nai? B'nai. No, you didn't. No, no. Um, I, I've seen a lot of things through, through my job. I, I know everywhere that I can, can spend that money. I'm a little more focused on the religious side of things at, at times. And I cared very, very much about my children understanding the rite of passage and, and going through that. And that the party was a celebration of our entire family. The fact that they worked so hard, they were the guests of honor at that, at that celebration, mm -hmm. but it wasn't their party. It was a celebration of all of us, of the fact that we were all here, that we had a wonderful thing happen in our family's life and that my husband and I were able to keep our children alive long enough to see it because <laughs> as a parent, there's days you don't think that's going to happen. But it really, we, we took much more of a track that this was um, a, a unifying thing, not just let's, let's put the kids in the middle and, and cater to their, to their every whim. Some people do that. Some people don't, and there's no right or wrong way. And I'm, I'm always very, very careful to say sure. that. Um, there's no right or wrong way to, to celebrate your family. I, I truly believe there should never be any judgment in that. So I'm always very careful to say that, um, sure. especially because of what I do. So we're, and your kids were like, they were cool with that. They were on board with, yeah, with the idea. I mean, there they, they didn't have any unreasonable choice. expectations. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's funny. I, I brought them to, you know, they come to showcases, which is, you know, right. how you and I got to know each other. And I can remember the first time they were eight or nine and they walked in and they looked around and they were like, oh my. God, this is fun. Because <laughs> the showcase, as I describe it, is four hours of sensory overload where That's every way you can spend money in a party is in a hotel ballroom. It's awesome. And there's candy and there's fun things and there's giveaways. And what could be bad for an eight, nine-year-old? And I said, do you yeah. see all of this? Yeah. I said, you're not going to have any of it. <laughs> 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 and they're like, okay, <laughs> we got it. But we had, you know, we had our fun and, and we were excited to celebrate and we incorporated all kinds of fun things and, 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 and celebrated the, the kids and the great work that we did. And yes, we had a couple splurges because I know a lot of different things in different ways. And I wanted 
you know, there to be some like different, really fun elements because it's a party and you want to have a good time. They, they were totally on board with it. They, un- they understood it. Do I hope that that part stuck with them? I hope so. I think mm. so. Um, you know, we're it's a few years removed from it. Let's see where they are 15 years from now or when they're at the point where they're planning their own children's uh, bar about that's fun and how they feel about it. I, I, I would wager if I had to that that will be something that sticks with them because I even though you know every kid has their issues with their parents and we fight when we're teenagers and all that we all seem to and at some point most of us become adults and then we go back to our parents like hey I'm sorry for all that stuff I get it now you know you all have that moment with your parents like totally get it you were right um, I call my mother every day and apologize for something. Right, exactly. I'm like, hey, remember that time when I was like yep. 14, gave you hell for that thing? Uh, that was a mistake. I'm it. sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, but I really do think because so many of the lessons that I didn't realize I was learning from my parents when I was that age have become such a huge part of my character. Once I got through the find out who you are and test everything out in college phase, you know, and then you start to figure out, who, you know, what kind of a person do I really want to be? And I, I, I would wager that that lesson of this is not about the extravagance, it's, it's about the community, um, that that's a lesson that's going to serve them well, I, I, I would think. I hope so. If you were in an elevator, if you were in an, I know, I know. If you were in an elevator, it's not where you think it's going. <laughs> <laughs> if you were in an elevator and you happened to bump into a parent that was planning their child, their first child's bar bat mitzvah, and you've got 15 seconds before they get off, what advice do you have for them in you know 15 seconds, 20 seconds? What's the one thing you tell them? I, I feel like I sound like a broken record because I, I've been saying this and it is what yeah. I say to everyone is that anything you do is lovely. And that's the truth. Any way that you choose to celebrate your child or celebrate your family is lovely. And how exciting that you get to do that. Kind of bring this on into uh, to to the end here. Um, Before I kind of ask you one last question, is is there anything that you'd like to say or plug or blurb or promote? And I I, I can do it in the outro when I record that later, if you'd like me to. Look, I think everyone, if they're in a stage of, of, of party planning, and are looking for resources and are looking for creative ideas, they should come and visit mitzvahmarket.com. It's a great resource, uh, not just for bar and bat mitzvahs, but for weddings and sweet 16s and, and quinceañeras and surprise parties and birthday parties, you name it, because there's just a lot of creativity there uh, and a lot of um, editorial. So you can see different ideas in action. Chances are if that if you have something in your brain and you type in that keyword, you're going to find that someone else has done it somewhere and there's an example. And it's a lot of fun. And there's something very nice about finding a community where you can ask questions and and get resources and have a a peer group, whether it's a virtual or a a right in front of you peer group of people who are doing the exact same thing at the exact same time and can empathize and sympathize with what you're going through. That's great. I will make sure that the mitzvahmarket.com is in the show notes. Thank you. So my last question If you're willing to answer, this would be, I think, a very uh, generous thing for anybody on the vendor side, people in my position uh, who, you know, are entertainers, are DJs, are, you know, uh, uh, the giveaways, all the different types of things. Like you said, this (laughs) ballroom full of everything you could possibly spend money on. You've been at how many of these do you do a year? We've done over the years anywhere between four and six a year, and I'm okay. on my eighth year. <laughs> so you've seen a lot of them. What one thing you would tell a vendor to help them succeed at one of these showcases? What's something you've seen that the successful vendors do year after year and the ones who fail or don't get enough business or don't get any business that they don't do? The successful vendors get out from behind the table. They they look at what people are doing. They might specify on on what they're wearing or what they're seeing or or pick up on a snippet of conversation and they're going to engage the people who are walking by and they are going to actively recruit them over to talk to them not wait for families to come to them they're going to meet them halfway to to start that conversation and they're going to get their contact information right away and follow up when there's someone who's directly in front of you and is at, is really interested in what you're doing get that information so that within 24 hours you can follow up with them and you can continue that conversation. And that to me is the most important. 
Don't waste for the other list. Don't do general things. Don't think that people, because they met you, are just going to call you. They're meeting 50 other people. They are overwhelmed and shell-shocked in that room. And they also might not be at the point in their planning where they're ready for you. So if they're two years out from their event, they're not looking for a magician until they're three to six months out from their event. Great advice. I really appreciate your time. I hope this was... Uh, I. That, go, that didn't go as bad as you thought it was going to go. It was a lot of fun. I still don't think I'm all that interesting, but you know. I think you're very interesting. <laughs> Before you start another Seinfeld marathon, here are a few takeaways from this episode. First, however you choose to share your family's special moments with the community is beautiful. So we should try really hard not to judge at mitzvahs, weddings, milestone birthdays, as being too much or not enough. Simply be grateful you were included. Second, nothing is more valuable than trust. Carolyn is willing to suggest a lower priced or lower profit margin service to her clients when it's the right fit for them. When you surprise and delight people instead of taking advantage of them, you'll find fans for life. And finally, if you want to succeed in the service industry, meet, people where they're at. Find common ground, connect with them, and follow up when it's appropriate. Don't forget to check out mitzvahmarket.com if you're planning a bar or bat mitzvah, sweet 16, quinceanera, or similar event. It's a fantastic and constantly evolving resource. I'm Brian Miller, this is One New Person, and we'll see you next time.